button. There we go. Welcome everyone to the February Cyber Ed webinar series. We've got a great webinar lined up for you today. We've got some great friends from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, and we are going to talk about a topic that is so relevant uh, to today. Uh, we're seeing it in the news all over the place. We're seeing it in our school systems um, day in and day out, and, and that topic's around ransomware and the vulnerabilities that uh, ransomware you know, places on our day-to-day -day lives in our classrooms and, and, and amongst our students in our schools. So uh, we have a, a great speaker and a great team from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency uh, with you or with us, with you too, uh, with us today. So uh, without further ado, let's get this started because I know this topic is 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 just so rich and uh, we've got uh, an awesome discussion that's going to ensue today. So we are lucky to have Ben Gilbert uh, with us today. He is a cybersecurity advisor for Region 3 with the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Uh, and CISA, if you're not familiar with that, um, is a section of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. And, and the things that he does on a day-to-day -day basis is um, conducts various cyber uh, preparedness, risk and private partnership uh, work, and does a lot of outreach to, to different industry and uh, the private sector uh, across the country. So without further ado, Ben, I'm going to turn it over to you and the cyber.org floor is all yours. Okay, can you hear me? Perfect. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as, as Kevin mentioned, Ben Gilbert, I'm a cybersecurity advisor with the Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Uh, we are essentially the newest agency in the federal government. Uh, the uh, president signed off on legislation back in uh, November of 2018 uh, with uh, our, our agency's mission simply to uh, simply but very broadly, I should say, to essentially lead the national effort to understand and manage uh, risks to our nation's critical uh, infrastructure. Uh, and in that vein, we often consider ourselves um, uh, our na the nation's risk advisors, so to speak. Um, and, you know, just a slide today, you know, the, as Kevin mentioned, uh, we're going to be going through a series of uh, very interesting topic discussion here on um, ransomware. Uh, and what it is and how it really impacts uh, organizations, particularly uh, with the various school systems across the country. Um, now, Ke Kevin, did uh, you have any questions uh, or did you, how did you wanna go through this here today? So Kevin had to jet, so you have free range. Oh, fantastic. Yep. All right. <laughs> well, all right. So let's let's get into it then. Um, so uh, first, what is ransomware? Um, I, I, I think everybody, uh, most folks have heard of ransomware uh, from, you know, various uh, media news, you know, big things happening in the news. Um, but essentially ransomware, you know, in a very basic sense uh, is a form of uh, what we call malware, malicious software um, that essentially encrypts or locks a computer and the data uh, on that computer. And uh, it, after it's locked, the, uh, the cyber criminal that, that's uh, deployed that, that version of malware on there, they typically ask for a ransom in order to uh, decrypt or unlock that computer. Um, and you often have to provide, you know, that ransom in form of Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency uh, to be able to uh, you know, get access to that, that data again, theoretically. Um, that said, you know, because this is, we we're talking about cyber criminals here, there's absolutely no guarantee you will ever actually get that decryption key uh, from that criminal. Um, there are, you know, and, and as I mentioned, there is a, you know, ransomware is, is a form of, of malware. There are 
other forms of malware out there um, from botnets to root kits, spyware viruses and worms. Um, you know, there's also what we call remote access Trojans, which is another form of malicious software that's out there. All this is important to note because uh, cyber criminals will often use all these different versions of, of malware and tools that are out there. All malware is basically just a tool uh, for the cyber criminals to be able to carry out some sort of activity or, or uh, you know, objective that they're trying to meet. Um, you know, botnets and rootkits are just an example of what those some of those tools are. Ransomware is an example of another tool there. Um, but it is important to note that. Um, so why, how do ransomware attacks happen? Um, well, first off, let me talk a little bit about, you know, dig into a bit more about uh, the different types of malware and, uh, you know, ransomware that is out there. As I mentioned, ransomware is just a type of malware. There's different, very, uh, what we call variants of ma ma ransomware that are out there. Uh, WannaCry probably, you know, I, I think many folks have probably heard this a uh, few years back, uh, back in 2017 or so um, in the news, uh, probably the uh, most widespread outbreak of what we call ransomware uh, that is out there and, and, and probably the, the most well-known uh, earliest version of, of ransomware, although ransomware has been around for actually a couple decades, believe it or not. Uh, Regal, Sun, and Okibi are examples of different versions of ransomware that target things such as cloud providers that are out there. Um, things such as, you know, Microsoft Azure or Apple iCloud are examples of those cloud-based operating environments. Ryuk is an example of a variant that targets school systems and state and local governments that is often used in terms of that. And there's many, many other versions of, uh, you know, ransomware that are out there that target different in industry segments. There's other, as I mentioned earlier, there's other types of malware that also have different functions and features. Ransomware, its main objective is to encrypt data, encrypt that computer and ask for a ransom. You know, and then the threat actors or the cyber uh, criminals will deploy uh, that those versions of ransomware on there, but they often, use things such as remote, what we call remote access Trojans to deliver that ransomware into those computer systems. Um, you know, TrickBot, Emotet are examples of those that are out there. If you've heard that before, I mean, the, and these are, these can kind of get into, uh, you know, a bit too technical. Advanced persistent threats is an example of a, a threat actor that is very, very sophisticated that basically carries out very sophisticated, very methodical attacks um, to be able to carry out their objectives. And it's just another example of threats that are out there. Walking through this uh, slide, and this is a very interesting slide. So oftentimes I get the question on, well, how do ransomware attacks happen? Um, so going back to, again, the example of, of ransomware, a real quick here. Um, another way to think about this and kind of an analogy I like to use is oftentimes a, uh, you know, if you think of, you know, maybe a burglar or a criminal um, breaking into your house and they steal your laptop at your house and they throw that laptop into a safe and they lock the key. Uh, and then they ask you for money in, in form of obviously in a ransom in order to get that key back. Right now, that's just an example of, you know, an analogy of, of how ransomware would work, but, you know, in, um, in kind of, you know, in real life, so to speak, um, in, in your own home. Um, walking through this from a, the perspective of an, a cyber attack, and it's important to understand too, ransomware attacks are just an example of a cyber attack. Um, you know, there's many, many different ways to carry out a cyber attack that are out there, but, and there's many different tools and, and methods that are used. Generally speaking though, most cyber attacks, when you're talking about whether it's ransomware or, you know, uh, a data breach of some sort, um, or even advanced persistent threat actors that are out there, 
all of those cyber attacks, generally speaking, follow a very step by, you know, a, a very general step by step approach uh, to be able to get into those systems. It often starts with um, what we call external reconnaissance. So, you know, doing open source research on that organization, on that school system, going into LinkedIn profiles, looking at Facebook, uh, um, LinkedIn, um, you know, Instagram, gaining access to that public information that, that we all put out there on ourselves. Um, and those cyber criminals that are out there, they use that information to start to build kind of a profile to that organization. They're not necessarily targeting you for what you have. They're targeting you for the information and the access that you have to the organization. So they'll gain as much of that information as they can from a number of different sources. They can, you know, either through Google, um, you know, again, Twitter accounts, they'll look and watch and see um, and, and take note of, you know, who has access to what, and they'll start to map out that access. Um, this can also be done, you know, even more aggressively, such as emails, for instance, um, so to speak, and emailing folks within that organization to gather that type of information so that they can use that um, in order to carry out their attack. Once they have enough of that information, then they'll carry out their initial uh, attack. Um, roughly nine times out of a 10, that attack starts by a phishing email attempt um, because it's just so easy to carry out and it's so easy to fool even the most seasoned security professional and organizations that are out there. And so, in the, and you see in this chart, I even added in here a remote worker distance learning ability because a, a cyber actor can target those individuals that are in remote, um, you know, remote workers or distance learning environments, such as students or teachers, and so to speak. Um, and they can essentially fish those, those uh, end users to be able to find a way to get into those systems. Um, another way is by maybe uh, security vulnerabilities within the different software that is being used, right? So essentially a vulnerability would be, you know, kind of like a, you know, think of a fence, a vulnerability, a hole in a fence, so to speak. Uh, you can look at vulnerabilities as holes into the, those systems and that software that almost like back doors that um, can be used to get into those systems. So cyber criminals will look for ways to be able to do that. Once they get into that, uh, that they carry out their initial um, attack through whatever those that, that attack vector, from that point, they will then work to establish a foothold into that, that computer, that operating system. They'll establish a foothold, they'll try to maintain presence, and they'll work to what we call escalate their permissions. So the permissions that you have on your computer by default are just basic user permissions. Um, there's different levels of permissions um, up to, you know, administrator level permissions on computers and on in, in different networks, so to speak. So that attacker tries to escalate those permissions, even system level permissions to get in there to work. And then from that point, they'll start to look across the network. They start to conduct their own internal scanning network reconnaissance and basically discover other systems inside the network and then after they do that they again work to escalate their permissions move laterally throughout those networks and other computers in the system and that network until they identify what we call their high value targets and at that point then they will you know carry out their mission now, if it's something such as ransomware, because those they're often these cyber criminals, they're only worried about getting as large of an impact as they possibly can and as quick as they possibly can. Um, so this whole step-by-step -step process often goes by very quickly. Um, and so it's one thing I do want to the reason why I like to explain this slide is because it is important to note that when you, whether it's ransomware or any other cyber attack, the 
the uh, that criminal is it's not just some kid in a basement or someone in a hoodie in a duffer country just typing away at a keyboard. These attacks have become very methodical, very industrialized, and very very business like approach because the reality is ransomware is more or less a business uh, to these cyber criminals. There are many different cyber syndicates that are criminal syndicates that are out there that carry out these types of attacks and these um, they are often very, very successful. Um, now, another question I often get, uh, and this is an example of, you know, maybe one of those phishing attacks that are out there, right? So, um, you know, could you be fooled potentially by uh, a phishing can, uh, attack such as this, right? If it's, if it's crafted well enough and it's, you know, pointed toward you and it looks like it's coming from someone within your organization uh, and its topic is generally something, you know, relating to current events such as, okay, you know, relating to the coronavirus outbreak. Um, let's say this in the, in the email, this was information about uh, where you can go to uh, register to get your vaccine. Um, that's very compelling information that would encourage that, 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 the you know whoever got this email to click on that link and if it was crafted well enough they would get a lot of hits on that link now if that link ended up going to somewhere um you know malicious that is a way that you know that would potentially be that 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 initial attack vector that initial point where the cyber attack uh cyber actor can get into those systems um now, this that would be an example of more of a sophisticated um, uh, phishing email attempt. But the reality is, um, these can be less sophisticated. I think everybody you know knows, or most people know, not to click on those emails from the Saudi Arabian prince that you know is asking uh, for you to mail him a hundred dollar check, and he'll give you uh, you know a couple of Bitcoin in return, right? I think gone are the days that that's, you know, I think most people, there's still some people that click on those links, but by and large, most people recognize that is um, a blatant phishing attempt. What's not as easily recognizable is when you get emails like this, um, that looks very legitimate. And so it's very important that, that all end users, whether you're students or teachers or, um, you know, um, uh, administrative staff or or even your IT uh, folks, they can recognize what these phishing attacks, these phishing emails look like. And even more importantly, if you've clicked on that link or clicked on that bad, uh, that malicious file, more importantly, it's important to report that that immediately. Very important to be able to do that. Um, hey, Ben. Ben, yes. we have a question. Um, did Absolutely. we know specifically um, how many schools are affected by these types of attacks and what can teachers do to um, protect their students um, from these types of attacks? So two questions. So that, the first, how many schools? And then the second, what are some pro, pro, uh, protective measures or preventive measures? So that, that thanks, Latasha. That's a, I, I don't have um, my, my, you know, this is the, you know, the, the age of trying to, uh, figure out what you know how these different uh you know uh platforms work you know whether between zoom or you know teams and so to speak so i can't ever get the uh comments section to prop up on my screen properly so i i apologize about that um yeah so back to the question so i i don't have specific numbers uh of how many schools i will say um we have seen a large income increase in um, ransomware attacks against schools within just the past year. Um, even before uh, the coronavirus outbreak, um, we were starting to see a large uptick in, in schools uh, being victims of ransomware attacks. And uh, in the current you know, uh, coronavirus uh, you know, pandemic that we're in, that has just uh, escalated even more so. Um, you know, partly, the reason why is because you have emails like this that could potentially come out, entice folks to really, you know, to click on those links. It's just much easier for uh, those cyber criminals to carry out the, those attacks. 
Um, but yeah, it, um, I would say definitely over the past year or two, we have seen a very, very large increase. Um, I can tell you from my experience, um, just in my area, and I, I cover, um, you know, the, you know, the, one of the things we didn't explain was, um, you know, that I didn't mention earlier, um, I won't get into it now, but CISA has a regional presence across the country. I'm one of the regional operators um in the east coast and i've, I've been a part of uh, a number of different ransomware incidents with a number of different organizations that are there and i could tell you that that school systems absolutely are being a targeted um and there is a much larger increase now to the second question um what can teachers and students do to prevent was that can you repeat that again latasha Yes, what can uh, students and teachers do to help uh, protect their students from uh, these types of attacks? What measures so, yeah. can we put in place? Absolutely. Another very good question. Um, and kind of almost getting ahead of myself here. Um, I'll actually bring this up now because there's a number of different things that um, not just your IT staff, but your end users to include your administrative staff, to include teachers, uh, to include students um, that they should be doing to help protect against this. Um, first and foremost is participate in security awareness training. Very, very important to be able to go through that training and also have an awareness of those threats that are out there. Have an awareness of the fact that, you know, there are cyber criminals that will target you um, as a student or as a teacher or as an administrative staff or anybody else, just simply because of the access that you have into that school system um, for no other reason, but because of the access you have in that school system. So really important to recognize that um, first and foremost and have that awareness, um, being aware of your digital footprint, um, you know, and knowing those end user security features that are available to you, um, you know, regardless of whether we're at home or work or in school, we are taking our personal lives with us across those different applications and across those different environments. You know, we bring our phones everywhere we go. Uh, we have immediate access to those, all of those various social media accounts that are out there. Uh, and it's important to recognize, you know, being aware of what we're providing out there. If we're in, you know, for instance, and, you know, this is maybe more, um i guess relevant in security related environments right but you know for instance you know if i as a government employee have access to very sensitive information i probably don't want to be tweeting that out uh on my phone that hey i'm in this location and i have access to this information right so the same thing with with you know for instance students and and schools and and, and teachers and so does and any type of staff you know, if you're in school, it's probably not the greatest idea to say, hey, I'm using, you know, Zoom and this is the version I'm on and this is what I'm doing right now. Um, so just being aware of that, right? Um, you know, putting that out there. Uh, knowing the, the, you know, there's a, the other point that's up here, knowing the back data backup options that are available to you um, and, you know, ensure your, your information is being stored uh, and backed up. Um, it, you know, this doesn't, I would say when you're working in the school systems and in the different applications, those, a lot of those applications, those systems are being backed up by those school systems. Um, but, you know, this is, I actually think back to a story, you know, back in another life years and years ago that I had, I used to work with a, a small business a uh, small uh, uh, computer business, and um, I and this, I'll use this kind of as a, a kind of a good anecdote for this. Um, one of the customers we had um, in, in that that business, in that uh, small business, was a, uh, a a teacher, and she was actually working on her PhD, uh, and she had her dissertation on her computer, and she actually got hit by some sort of virus um, that essentially crippled her computer and she wasn't able to have access to that 
uh, her computer anymore. It just totally hosed her computer all up. Uh, and she brought it to us and she was begging and pleading for us to get that really important to get that, you know, it covered because she had her dissertation on there, which was due in about a month. Uh, and she unfortunately did not back up uh, that dissertation to anything. Uh, and unfortunately, we, it, to our best efforts, we were not able to recover that computer. Um, and because of that, she lost her dissertation. I don't know what happened um, after that fact, but you know, you can only imagine how important, how much time and effort was spent in building that and not back something like that up is just, it's, it's one of those things where everybody knows they should, but not many people actually get in the habit of doing that. So students, you know, and teachers alike, it's really important to be able to back up the, those systems and back up their computers, even when it's just locally stored, have some sort of backup option and backup method in, in, in place so that if something were to happen, for instance, ransomware, um, you get hit by that and it encrypts your entire computer. And honestly, there, there's, you know, when, by the way, when this happens, the, the only true solution to when that happens is to literally wipe that computer and start from scratch. And in uh, school systems and operating environments, that ends up being the solution uh, if there, there is no other alternative. Literally wiping those systems and wiping the entire network uh, infrastructure and starting from scratch. And you can imagine how long that could actually take. So very, very important. Um, I know that's kind of very long-winded um, answer, <laughs> so to speak, but it actually goes right in line with uh, the, the slides uh, being presented today. Uh, Latasha, are there any other questions that are out there? No, I don't see another one just yet. Okay, fantastic. So I will, uh, let me back up here for just a minute. Um, so on the same lines of, well, what are some of the things schools and teachers and, 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 you know, even, you know, IT professionals can do uh, to, you know, help protect and prevent against this. So when you hear things such as these large, high profile ransomware incidents that occur, um, such as, you know, maybe the city of Baltimore getting hit by ransomware or the city of Atlanta uh, getting hit by ransomware. And it just basically locking up and prevents organizations from doing very basic things and has a large impact across the organization. The reason why, and unfortunately, the reason why that happens um, at such a large level is because um, organizations are not doing these basic things. They, you know, from an IT perspective, um, you know, Oftentimes we, you know, a lot of, a lot of organizations think, well, it's my, I, you know, IT uh, staff's job to worry about ransomware. Uh, it's not my responsibility. I don't need to worry about this or anything about, or it's my, you know, IT security folks' responsibility to worry about cybersecurity. Well, the reality is, is it's not just them. They do have a huge part um, and a huge piece in helping to protect organizations from things such as ransomware um, and these are this is just a list of those basic things that organizations should be doing to include school systems having an inventory of it you know all of your it assets um, you know you can't protect what you don't know you don't have right so really important to have that inventory um, not just of your your computers your hard you know your, your servers and your network infrastructure by having an inventory of the different software that you have on there. Um, you know, I don't know the, the I don't have a, a specific number here, but I'm going to speculate that the average company probably has upwards of anywhere between 50 to 75 different types of software that they have to manage um, across their enterprises. That's a lot. Uh, and, and if you don't, have a good inventory and understanding of what's in there, the different versions that are available and everything that, you know, that allows for cyber actors to, you know, 
really find those holes in that environment. It's just an easy step of doing. Um, you know, deploying antivirus on servers and workstations, another very easy step. Everybody knows this, right? But the reality is it's that one computer in the corner that was is maybe turned on once a month in the classroom. Um, maybe not as much anymore. Um, but it's that that, you know, you know, out at a band computer that's, you know, everybody's forgotten that maybe either has outdated or doesn't have any virus at all on there and cyber actors look for those systems as targets to be able to get in there and have easy access um you know we already talked about backing backing up data regularly um having known well tested and ag known accessible backup solutions implementing good patch management you know again going back to having an inventory of your software that's in the environment um, and making sure that those software are up to date with their latest security updates um, implementing strong user management practices you know things such as it's you know in the security arena we like to say least privilege access um, it's the least amount of privileges your end users should have in order to have access to a certain information the reason isn't because they're punishing you or they want to make your life difficult the reason is is because that access that you have if an actor if a cyber uh, attacker got into your system they all of a sudden have the same access you have now so by limiting access of all your end users that helps to minimize the impact and minimize the ability for that that cyber actor to move around in the environment. Um, all, you know, having a good incident response plan in place. I could tell you a number of different organizations that I've, I've uh, gone to that I'll ask if they have a cyber incident response plan in place. And they kind of look at me like, you know, I, I caught them with their pants down because the reality is they, they don't have a cyber incident response plan in place or if they do it's five or six years old and they haven't touched it they honestly don't know how to actually react to a, a large scale cyber incident um it goes you know developing good strong situation awareness as well you know um presentations and venues like this is a a good tool to be able to develop that strong situational awareness that's out there but there's other different resources that are out there many many different resources we have our you know our, you know with this ransomware awareness campaign we have our ransomware toolkit uh that ransomware awareness toolkit on our website and i'll talk about that here in a little bit um and not many other different resources that are available no cost resources that are available uh for students teachers even it security staff to get that awareness uh, of, of, you know, what those threats are um, and, you know, have, you know, essentially be, have that cyber readiness, so to speak. Uh, hey, Ben, I have, yes. sorry, sorry to interrupt, I have a couple of questions. I know you are going to get into um, reporting, but how is uh, cyber attacks handled maybe in a smaller school district? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. Um, and actually, it would even uh, jump here ahead here, um, you know, on on reporting. So maybe it, it might be important. Or well, let me let me uh, put it this way, because that's a very good question. It's important to understand. Um, I think why first off, why ransomware attacks become can become so impactful. Um, you know if, if you can imagine you know all of those systems uh, you know or a vast majority of the of the systems in schools being hit by ransomware and all of a sudden you're greeted by a screen that looks kind of like a lock you know a lockout screen that enters a password they have to enter a password to get into and except there is kind of a message above that that says you know, essentially, and it, oftentimes these ransomware messages can be pretty cordial and professional and basically saying, hey, you've hit, been hit by a ransomware attack, um, you know, and it's unfortunate because your, you know, your school, your organization didn't um, have good enough security practices in place. And they will say, often say that. Uh, and then you can imagine, you know, being greeted by this screen and, you know, at the bottom it says, 
um, click here for more information on being able to send us uh, 50 Bitcoin. Um, well, 50 Bitcoin nowadays is 200, roughly $250,000, right? So when you see something like that, you can imagine the amount of panic that, that anyone could, would probably go into when you get a great, you're greeted by a message like that. So multiply that across the organization. And now it all of a sudden becomes a very, very serious issue very, very quickly. And this is why it's so important to have those ransomware or not ransom, but have a cybersecurity plan in place. You know, the first thing, you know, what are the first things end users should think about doing when they get seen a screen like that? Well, first thing they should do is immediately contact their IT staff, or if they don't have IT staff, immediately contact uh, the school administrator um, and notify them. The IT staff and school administrators, once they receive that information, they should immediately contact uh, either low, uh, law enforcement or, you know, if they have cyber insurance, contact their cyber insurance, um, you know, contact, you know, if they have a uh, incident response team or if they've hired a company to be that incident response team, you know, immediately make that contact. Really, really important to react and respond as quickly as possible. Um, you know, when you're talking about a smaller school system um, who might not be aware of this, you know, I, again, it, it goes back to that immediate response. Um, one of the things that, you know, an, another reason why I point back to having that response plan in place is, especially with ransomware, um, you know, there's that adage, you know, uh, uh, um, what is it, uh, ounce of cure equals a pound of or an ounce of uh, practice equals a pound of cure, um, something along those lines. Um, that's absolutely true and probably so much more true when it comes to ransomware. The amount of that, that organizations take to prepare has a huge amount of impact on, well, really how impactful that ransomware is going to be. The more prepared organizations are ahead of time, um, the, the quicker they are able to react to that ransomware uh, incident and the quicker that they can recover from that incident. Um, and, you know, it, even with larger uh, school systems, um, there's very, very large school systems that have also got hit by ransomware attacks as well. Um, you know, that just shows that even larger school systems that have money can still be susceptible to this, but it's the amount of effort that they put into preparing um, ahead of time that helps them recover very quickly and rapidly from that. So, you know, again, can't emphasize enough the importance of preparation ahead of time, knowing, you know, doing these basic things ahead of time, having that cyber response plan in place ahead of time, know who your, your internal key points of contact are, who you need to contact right away. Uh, and, you know, from internally into your organization and externally, uh, who you need to contact right away. Uh, law enforcement, whether it's federal, local, state, or federal law enforcement, uh, FBI has a great uh, response capability when it comes to law enforcement um, efforts that they have in place. CISA has an incident response capability um, is, as well as, you know, in, in the lane of helping that organization understand what they need to be doing to respond and recover from that incident. Um, so have those key points of context available to you. Um, very, very important. Um, and externally also think about things such as, you know, I mentioned cyber insurance. Uh, if you have cyber, you know, insurance, make sure you have that point of contact available. Um, public affairs office, if you, you know, within your county or, you know, local uh, government systems, you know, or, you know, within your school systems, you know, know how to handle the media aspect of this, because that information is going to get out very, very quickly. And you want to be able to get ahead of it. You want to be able to get the right messaging out uh, to the public about what is going on, um, what, what to say, and important, more importantly, what not to say as well. Um, so make sure you have that information ahead of time, have those conversations ahead of time. Very, very important to be able to prepare. 
Um, hey, Ben. Yeah, are there any other thoughts for the yes. other questions? Mm -hmm. Should school districts farm out their cybersecurity or hire their own team? That is a, that's another question. And honestly, that's, that's something that I think many organizations are trying to uh, grapple with right now. There's a number of different factors, obviously cost being probably the, the primary factor because hiring cybersecurity staff is very expensive. Um, but it's also important to have someone, whether it's from an outside party or internally, uh, to be able to set up your infrastructure properly so that it's secure um, and be able to maintain that environment. Uh, whether or not it's, you know, you hire from the outside or, um, you know, hire from within, um, I would say, honestly, it's up to that organization. It's a, it's a, a cost factor is certainly an aspect of it, but it's a resource availability issue just as well, too. Um, you know, cybersecurity skills uh, and, and skilled cybersecurity practitioners uh, are in huge demand. And there is a massive, uh, um, I guess, a, a shortage, so to speak, of skilled cybersecurity staff. Um, so if you're able to, and school systems are in a great position to do this because they're there, to, they're there as educators. So if you're able to build programs and educate students and staff and kind of educate and build within, you know, that would be a great model, you know, to take advantage of too. Um, but again, it depends on the organization. Thank you. Another question, um, which is a, a really great question as far as, you know, sometimes hospital schools, law enforcement, they decide to pay the ransom. Um, how do you go about, um, you know, recovering without paying them? Well, that and that is a great question. I will first say that, you know, at least, you know, the, the, the U.S. government's official response to this is do not pay the ransom uh, for a number of reasons. It, it, it basically just it, it furthers the encouragement of that, that, um, you know, that cyber actor to continue, um, you know, that behavior, right? Um, it just, it, it, it reinforces that bad behavior, it ultimately is what that is. So um, not only that, but if you pay that ransom, you're still never, you're not guaranteed to get that, that data back. Um, you know, from the attacker's perspective, it would probably behoove them to give that back because if they wanted to keep that business model going, because remember, ransomware is a more or less a business model um, to that to these criminals that are out there. Um, so you know it encourages them to continue that. But they could just say, "Hey, you know what? You paid us. We don't need to give your data back to you." Um, and that's the reality of it. So faced with that reality, you know it. You definitely want to, at all costs, try not to uh, pay that ransom and try to recover. Um, from that. And I will say the, you know, again, going back to the basics, right? Having those backup systems in place and having them known and accessible um, and really out of band, right? You know, you, you don't, when I say accessible, I don't mean on the same network because the reality is those cyber act, you know, those cyber criminals, that's usually the first thing they target is those backups because they know. Um, that's going to be the first place you look uh, to try to get your information back. And uh, so they, they really try to go after that and, and, you know, find ways to get you to pay. Um, so be cautious of that and have a backup system in place that you can access without having, you know, in that uh, environment, right? Offline data backups are, are, you know, a good way to doing that. Um, you know, again, having the basic practices in place. If you are practicing good um, user management practices uh, within your organization, that limits that, that cyber actors or that, that attackers um, ability to move across the network as fast as they can. And again, with ransomware, their objective is to um, is, is broadcast and, and push out that ransomware as quickly and as 
um, far reaching as they possibly can. So the more you can slow them down in doing that, the better chances of ER of recovering uh, from that. Um, but I will say the recovery efforts are often the, you know, what we call the longest pull in the tent. Um, it is the largest amount of effort. And again, it, all of the preparedness that goes into it depends on how quickly you can recover. If you're an organization that really hasn't done a lot of preparedness, um, the reality is it, it's not going to be a bad couple days for you, especially from the IT perspective. It's going to be a bad couple weeks, if not a bad couple months. And that's the reality of it. Um, so it's really, really important to do that preparedness ahead of time. Awesome, thank you. Another question, how often are ransomware attackers actually caught and persecuted, prosecuted, excuse me? So that honestly is more of a question for the FBI, but I, I can, and I will say that, that you know, there, 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 there has been a prosecution that, that has been in place with some of these, um, you know, um, criminal elements. I will say it is very, very difficult. Um, First and foremost, it's it's difficult to get the attribution. What we mean by attribution is, is the the essentially the who, the what, the when, the where, the why, right? Getting that evidence together enough to be able to pin it on a particular individual or particular party is very, very difficult um, to do. And once they do have that information, most of the time you're talking about, you know, um, someone in a different country or a number of different countries. So now you're talking about, um, you know, jurisdictional issues and, you know, whether or not, you know, their, you know, that country's laws will enable, you know, some sort of indictment uh, to occur. Oftentimes, if you're talking about like a country like Russia or China, chances, you know, chances are that's less likely, right? So it's, it is very difficult, um, but, you know, it is really something that the FBI is really more focused on, um, which brings me to maybe another quick point real quick before we go to another question here. Um, you know, when, when you're thinking about, you know, again, CIS is a new agency. Many folks are, are, are just becoming aware of, 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 you know, what our agency is and what our agency does. Uh, many, you know, many folks who have gone through a cyber incident have probably interacted with the FBI to some degree or another, um, more than likely. Um, you know, so when you're thinking about, well, if I needed to report, you know, who do I report to? Do I report to CISA? Do I report to FBI? Um, and the answer is really either or both. Um, it doesn't matter because we work um, in the back end. We work very closely. We each other when it comes to level, but each of us has our own different lanes too. The FBI is really focused on uh, the threat and going after the threat itself. And I just got a message on my screen that I might lose internet connection. So hopefully that's not the case. Um, so the FBI is primarily responding to the threat, um, treating that, that incident as a crime, treating the ransomware incident as a crime, looking for attribution and evidence to go after and take care of the, you know, and going after the perpetrator of, the, of, of that incident. CISA um, is what we call the asset responder. We're there and we're gonna come in and almost as a firefighter, suppose, so to speak, and help that organization respond and recover from that incidence. Uh, we also look for attribution, you know, from the perspective of, you know, looking at different tools, tactics, and procedures, because that's important that helps us know who we're dealing with. And we work very closely with the FBI on that in the background um, during the, those types of incidents. Um, but it's important to understand the different, you know, roles and lanes there, because if you call the FBI and then they're the only ones that are on, on this, on, on scene, just know that their focus is on the crime itself. Their focus is not necessarily to help you as an organization respond and recover from that. They do have the expertise. They just, they're not resourced and that's not their mission, so to speak. So it is important to understand that. Perfect. Thank you. And our final question before you go to your last slide. Um, if you are attacked, should you make it public? 
So again, that, that's, that's honestly a question, you know, for the organization. This is why it's important to involve your, you know, public affairs um, office um, or any person that, that deals with media in your organization. If you don't have that, uh, FBI is, you know, is oftentimes uh, has a lot of um, knowledge and, and, and resources in this area to help um, that organization know what to say, what not to say. Um, there's a lot of different things to think about. Obviously, optics being a huge piece of that, right? Um, not to mention, you don't want to say too much as well, because you don't want to impede the investigation and ongoing investigation that's going on. So it is important to know what to say, what not to say. Um, I would say you would definitely want to talk with your public affairs folks or someone that handles those media type questions um, and have those and important, have those discussions ahead of time. Talk with the FBI, talk with your law, uh, law enforcement folks. Um, that helps if you have a cyber insurance um, policy in place, talk with your cyber insurance provider, because oftentimes, again, they, you know, they, they have legal experts that know how to handle that and what to say. Perfect. Thank you. And you can um, go ahead to your final slide. And then we have an awesome video to show before we wrap up. Perfect. So I do want to say, and I could even, well, let's go back real quick here. Um, mention, you know, the number, first off, the number of resources that we have available at CISA. Again, you know, our, I'd say at our agency, you know, because we're focused on, you know, risk reduction across all, you know, different in environments, you know, one of our goals as an agency is to provide a number of resources, a number of no cost voluntary resources to organizations. And when specifically to ransomware, we have a number of different resources on our website um, that is available. Um, you know, first off, please come out, visit our website because you'll find a whole ton of information, very, very useful information on there. Um, but things such as, um, you know, the ransomware guide, we have a ransomware uh, insight, what we call a CISA insights. Um, talking about ransomware outbreaks that are that are there. CISA insights um, are basically, um, you know, the best way to describe it is a non-technical kind of one pager on what exactly the issue is, what's going on, why it's important to you, and what you should be doing and thinking about what you what you should do. Um, so come out, take a look at some of these different resources that are out there. There's more technical information out there if you have IT staff or you are one of the IT staff. Um, you know, such as some of the uh, US CERT alerts uh, that are out there. Um, there's a number of different resources available, um, you know, to include a ransomware awareness toolkit that we have on our website. Um, fast forwarding again to, um, you know, the end slide here, um, you know, a number of different cybersecurity assessments. We have 10 different cybersecurity assessments, all no cost. Um, that we offer, you know, um, all sorts of different public and private sector organizations to include school systems. Um, you know, they range from very, very strategic, you know, thinking policy and practice, um, all the way to the very, very technical, such as um, pen, pen, what we call penetration testing, um, or it's essentially, you know, ethical hacking, so to speak. We have teams that can do that um, and carry out those types of assessments. Um, all sorts of cybersecurity training and awareness. Our national, um, we have a website. Uh, you can find it on CISA.gov website um, called the National Initiative for, correct me if I'm wrong, Latasha, National Initiative for Cybersecurity Careers and Studies website that has all sorts of information relating to different cybersecurity training and awareness that's out there. Um, you know, um, you know, cybersecurity awareness resources. Uh, if your IT staff or if your government employees, such as a part of a public school system, you have access to free cybersecurity training. Um, and it's anything from the 101 on what is cybersecurity, why do I need to care about this, all the way to uh, no kidding certification level courses, such as like a certified ethical hacker uh, certification on there. All of that's available at no cost uh, to state and local government organizations. And it's on that website great amount of information. Um, and I mentioned earlier before, you know, 
CISA has a response capability. Uh, we call it CISA Central. It's essentially a 24 by seven by 365 day a year uh, security operations center um, that we are working very closely with not just federal government agencies, but also state government agencies, local government agencies and private sector uh, critical infrastructure partners uh, all across the country and even globally. Uh, and so um, if there is an incident, um, large scale incident that's reported to us, we could share that information accordingly with those organizations and help respond to those uh, incidents. Um, and lastly, I'll you know, I'll kind of, uh, you know, you know, put in, a, um, you know, a little bit for myself and other cybersecurity advisors that are out there, as I mentioned, um, or, you know, briefly mentioned earlier, uh, CISA has a regional presence across the country, kind of like FEMA. Uh, we're broken out to different regions across the country. Um, and across those different regions, uh, we have different uh, fields, uh, regionally deployed staff. Uh, within each of those regions that that works down at the local levels, um, essentially the what I like to call boots on the ground, face to face touch point with CISA and the resources that we have. And I'm one of those one of right now, we just actually hired our 26th cybersecurity advisor um, up in Delaware uh, last week. Uh, but I'm one of 26 cybersecurity advisors across the country um, and can absolutely be that touch point. So, um, you know, strongly encourage you to reach out to us. Uh, you know, there's my email there if you wanted to, you know, e email me directly. Uh, if you wanted to uh, find, you know, email our cybersecurity advisor box, uh, more generally speaking, to find out who your cybersecurity advisor is in your region uh, or your state or area. Um, you can certainly email that box. Um, again, visit our website. Um, and if you have a, if you're an IT or a you know, city or a county or school administrator um, and you need to report a cyber incident to us, the information is there at the bottom as well. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. Um, back to you, David, to cue the video. type of malware that holds a victim's data for ransom. That is, the attacker typically locks up the victim's data until the victim pays them a certain amount of money to have it unlocked, although it is not guaranteed the attacker will actually unlock the victim's data. Additionally, the attacker typically wants the victim to pay in a cryptocurrency, such as Bitcoin, to remain as anonymous as possible. You can avoid becoming a victim of ransomware by not downloading software from unknown or unverified sources, avoid clicking untrustworthy links in email, backing up your data frequently, and never giving away personal information such as passwords and usernames. Victims of ransomware should report it immediately to CISA at www.us-cert.gov report, a local FBI field office or Secret Service field office. Stay safe out there. All right, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Uh, that ransomware video that you just saw is available on cyber.org. We'll drop a link in the chat. Uh, also wanted to mention that we heard about several cybersecurity professionals that may be involved in a ransomware attack uh, today in Ben's presentation. And so if you're curious about those, head over to cyber.org's uh, cybersecurity uh, career profiles and uh, check through those and, and see if you can match up with any of the ones that we talked about today. I also wanna be sure to invite you to our uh, webinar for next month. It's gonna be creating inclusive cyber education opportunities for students with disabilities. And that's gonna be on Thursday, March 18th from two to 3 p.m. Um, and we'll have that up soon for you guys to start registering. So again, thank you for coming and we'll have this posted on our website for you to review soon. So thanks everyone.